Hey guys, welcome back to Planet Mithril Paints and today we'll be showing you how to paint Elendo and Isildur. We will be doing individual tutorials for these models in their main sculpt forms, but we have a big planned tutorial for you coming up and we couldn't do one model without the other. So this should give you a little bit of a hint and insight as to what is coming uh, in the next few weeks on the channel. But we wanted to start off with Elendo and Isildur, two models which have some really nice rich textures and really nice to find detail for us to work with. So without further delay, please sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. Now we're going to start, as we always do, we're going to start just by base coating all the face areas on Elendil and Isildur with a nice smooth coating of Bugman's Glow. Make sure to get in all the little recesses around the eyes, around the mouth, under their eye lines, their brow, all that sort of area. Once that's done, you can now start applying a layer over all the flesh with a mix of Cadian Flesh Tone and Bugman's Glow. Apply this as an all over layer, again sinking into all the recesses. your wash is dry and we're going to reapply the previous layer of Bugman's Glow and Cadian Flesh Tone using a brush with a good point and we're just going to reframe the face leaving the uh, Reichman Flesh Shade showing around the eyes by the side of the nose around the mouth and just creating some definition and flow across their faces I mean they're currently staring down the Dark Lord there's going to be a little bit of angst on their face so we need to try and capture that as best we can on the models with this next layer Once you're happy with that stage and you've got all your layers in place where you like, start giving more definition to the faces by applying a layer again with pure Cadian Flesh Tone. Make sure your brush has got a nice thin point to it and we're just going to further push these highlights by concentrating on more of the upper areas and framing the face that little bit more. Areas to focus on are the brow, the nose, the very defined eyelids, the cheekbones which are quite prominent on both models and picking out their mouth amongst their beard and moustache. Once you're happy with that stage, now we're going to apply our first highlight with a mix of Cadian Flesh Tone and Kislev Flesh. Now the Kislev Flesh just brings the tone up a little bit more warmly and makes them look more like the, uh, the aged heroes of men that they would be at this point in the Battle of Dagolad. And we're going to apply a fine highlight by increasing the amount of Kislev Flesh in the mix. And we're going to frame more of their faces now. We're going to concentrate more on the cheekbones, the brow line on an end in particular, uh, the eyelids, the noses, and the, the nostrils down by the side of the nose. Uh, with Elendil in particular, his face has got a lot of defined lines and you can really create some good definition, particularly across his brow with some wrinkled lines uh, for the next highlight stage. And finally, we're just going to increase the amount of Kislev Flesh in the mix one more time round and just apply a very fine dot highlight to the uppermost areas of flesh, including the nose, the very edge of the brow, and the very uppermost points of the cheekbones. Once you're happy with how your faces look, you can very carefully, using a size 00 brush, fill in their eyes with Abaddon Black and Padded Witch Flesh. So these are heroes of the Men of Numenor. They want their armour to look a bit brighter and a lot more regal than that of their Minister of Counterparts. With the Minister, if we use quite a lot of washes to tone it down and make it look really worn and battle damaged. But that's not the case we're going to use for this. We are, however, going to start as we did with all the Minister of Fluff and all the other stuff we've painted on the channel before. We're going to start by base coating all the armour plating around them with lead belcher. You need to make sure you get all the greaves, the shoulder pads, the chest armour. Uh, don't forget to get nasted as well.
uh, and then we're going to apply a very light dry brush to all the chain mail with lead belcher again once you've filled in all the blocking on the main armour bodies. So once the wash is dried and you're happy with the look of them, we're going to apply a very fine highlight to the absolute edges of all the armour plating with a mix of Ironbreaker and Barahoff Blue. Now we're going to keep the concentration of Barahoff Blue extremely low in this because we do not want to overwhelm the look of the Ironbreaker and make it look blue. We just want that slight sense of regality and that slight sense of age-old magic to the armour. These are Numenor heroes after all. Carefully frame all the chest plate armour with a very fine tip to your brush. Go around all the pauldrons very carefully to make sure you get every edge nice and consistent. Uh, don't worry too much about this on Isildur because most of the trim on his armour is going to be gold but it's nice to have this framed anyway just so you know exactly where you need to put these highlights when it comes to doing the trim. Run your brush very carefully down the edge of Narsil and around the hilt just to create the essence of light bouncing off the metal and give the blade a bit of a sharp look. With the chain mail now, you can carefully apply a very light dry brush just to the bends in the knees and the uppermost areas with this mix just to accentuate where the knee is pushing the chain mail up towards the light source. Now we're going to paint in all the gold detail on the models. We're going to do this with Balthazar Gold. Again, this is a nice, rich base gold which we want to fully accentuate the character of these models on the tabletop. This also covers really well. Uh, you won't have to do too many layers over the black to give this a really solid look. So with a brush with a thin point, carefully pick out all the gold detailing. With a lindle, you're looking at the emblems on his chest, as well as all the trim along his armour, and you've got the folds down by the side of his legs. Also, not forgetting the rest of the helmet as well. And with the Sildur it's much the same. You've got a few of the emblems around him. With the Sildur now you want to really focus on framing the pauldrons and any of the trim around him because that's where most of this gold detail will sit on a Sildur compared to a Lendil. Now, once you're happy with the look of the gold, once the wash is dried, we're going to carefully edge highlight all these gold areas with Sycorax Bronze. This is just a way of naturally lifting the quite dark hue of the Balthazar gold and bringing it up to a more natural, regal look. As we didn't wash the trim, because it's quite a small area to wash and it would more or less just flood into the actual look of the armour itself, you can carefully pick out just the very apex corners of this bronze just to give it that look of light glinting off as he's lying there. We're going to carefully segment all the fronds on Elendil's helmet and frame the nose guard. Very, very carefully apply a very quick highlight just to the uppermost areas of the trim on the Sildur, again just to accentuate where the light will be hitting. Now it's important with these two models that we try and break them up as much as possible and give them as much independence and differentiation between the two of them as we can. So we're going to be painting Elendil's hair first and we're going to be doing it more of an old aged wizened kind of grey look. So we're going to start base coating Elendil's hair with a mix of dry bark and rhinox hide. We're now going to add a small amount of Bane Blade Brown to the previous mix and apply this as an all over layer all over his hair, moustache and beard. Make sure you get right up close to the follicles of his hair where his head meets the base. On 
once you're happy with how this looks, now we're going to start carefully picking out the individual strands across his hair and his beard with the previous mix. You can apply this in more of a rough layer than we would normally, but just make sure to catch every single bit of hair and beard and start creating some definition among the flowing hair. Now we're going to increase the amount of Bane Blade Brown in the mix and we're going to carefully start painstakingly picking out all the individual hairs across his beard and his hair. His beard is quite straight so it's quite easy just to get these lines in situ and create really nice natural definition. The hair is a little bit more complicated, it's a bit more wavy and all tousled as he's currently lying on the ground. But just take your time and finding out where to put these highlights shouldn't be a problem. Further increase the amount of Bane Blade Brown in the mix and just Continue to push these highlights a little bit further with each application. Making sure you've got a fine tip to your brush here is important as any stray lines at this point is going to create an unnatural look across the beard and the hair. You can start focusing this more down towards the end of the beard hair and towards the upper curls and most apex areas of the hair on the base itself. Now this is a little bit out there, but we want Alendor to look a little bit more old compared to his younger son who is currently lying next to him. So we're going to add a little bit of Administratum Grey to the overall Rhinox High Dryer Buck Bane Blade Brown mix. This will just give him that slight wizened look we want and make him look a little bit beyond his years. And again we're going to apply this as a very fine highlight just over all the beard and hair and concentrating this more on the absolute upper areas and curls of hair. We don't need to overdo this stage as we, if we overdo it he's going to start looking like Gandalf and we want to try and maintain those rich brown undertones throughout. With the Sildur we're going to use a slightly more complicated mix. Again, we want to create differentiation between him and Elendor as much as we can. So we're going to start base coating his hair with a three part mix of Mournfan Brown, Rhinox Hide and Doomball Brown. This will give more of a rich chocolatey look to the hair which will translate well when we get through to the final highlighting stages further on down the line. Now we're going to add a small amount of scrag brown to the overall Mournfang, Brown, Rhinox, Hide and Doomball mix. And again, as we did with the Lendor, we're going to apply this as a layer ready for the next washing stage. Now we're not applying this as an all over layer here. We want this hair to look significantly more scraggly and sweaty and unkempt uh, in comparison to his father. So we're going to be applying this in a very rough layer over all the hair, leaving the deepest recesses showing the Mournfang, Rhinox and Doomball mix. Uh, again, we don't really want to be too neat with this but we still want to make sure we're getting the highlights in more or less the right place at this stage and let the wash do its magic as and when we get to that. Once the wash is dry, now we're going to relay with the previous mix. We can pretty much just trace this over the layer stage we did before the wash, uh, just being a little bit tighter, a little bit neater, a little bit more focused. Because we didn't apply this as an all over layer, the wash would have created some really nice natural, almost dank depth to his hair. As he is sweaty, he has been fighting all day, all afternoon, all evening, and uh, his hair isn't going to be in the best state. So we're just going to apply this over all the hair that we had layered up previously, just to create some really nice definition and depth to all of his hair and beard. We're going to increase the amount of scrag brown in the mix for the next layer stage. You, at this point you want your scrag brown concentration to be no more than an approximate 50% of the, uh, the overall mixture. And again we're just going to apply this all over the hair again, tracing over the highlights again but keeping them nice and tight and thin so we've still got the under layers showing through the recesses and creating that natural sense of flow throughout his mane of hair. Now for the final highlight stage, we're going to add Gawthor Brown to the mix. Again, as with the Scrag Brown in the previous layer, you want this to be no more than 50% of your overall mixture made up of the actual Gawthor Brown. And we're just going to, again, apply this as a very thin highlight layer over all the hair, concentrating more on the upper crests of hair, particularly around his crown, framing the face really nicely with the hair that cascades either side, and picking out the very edges and tips of the beard and moustache. And with that, you have a Lendl and a Sildur's hair done.
Now we want their robes to be really bright, really vibrant and really stark in comparison to the men of the third age that we painted on the channel before. So to kick off their robes, we're gonna start with a base coat over all the robes with Mephiston Red. Now you're gonna to have to apply this in a couple of thin down layers to make sure you've got smooth, even coverage all over the model because the last thing we want is gappy coverage because it won't do the highlights any favors later on down the line make sure you carefully get between all of the armor plating along the back particularly of a silver and be very careful not to clip any of the pauldrons or chest armor as you work it into the front of a silver's chest with a lendil it's quite difficult to work out where some of this cloth is we would advise going for all the cloth that hangs down just below his hip uh, before you get to the cloth right at the very bottom of the model as well as again framing the outside of the open chest armor with the same mix again a few thin layers with Mephiston red will give you a really nice smooth coverage to the model but what we will say is make sure you wait for the first layer to dry before you go in with the second one because that will just pull the paint off the first layer which hasn't quite dried yet Now we're going to layer over again with a mix of Mephiston Red and Evil Sun Scarlet. But again, we're just going to apply this as an all over layer over all the robes now, just to really give that rich Numenorean Red that we want for these two legends of men. Once the wash is dry, now we can start blocking out some of the big areas of cloth, leaving the caraber crimson showing in the recesses. Quite a lot of the folds on the material are really well defined, so it's really easy to work out where this layer station needs to go. But the more complicated areas would be the trims around the hip cloth in particular, where it's more embroidered as it is defined. Particularly as quite a lot of this trim is later on down the line going to be framed with a very rich uh, goldish colour. We don't necessarily need to highlight all the trim on these areas. But it would be good practice just to draw your brush in thin lines across the uh, middle areas of this trim just to give a little bit more definition because you don't want that to look lacking where the main cloth has got so much body and definition. And so again we're just going to make sure we block out the biggest areas of the cloth leaving the caribou crimson showing in the deepest recesses the silver is a great model for this there are so many defined recesses and creases on material it's a real pleasure to work with on this model actually because it can really give a sense of folded and creased up material without a great deal of effort and again with the material on his chest exposed over his arm plating we're just going to frame that very carefully with the Mephiston Red and Evil Sun Scarlet mix just to give that definition and keep it constant over all the model. Continue to increase the amount of Evil Sun Scarlet in the mix for the next layer stage. Now again, as you've already got your blocked in layers from the previous stage, this stage will be nice and easy. We're going to reapply this over all the cloth as we just have done but we are instead going to try and keep our highlights a little bit more thin, a little bit more precise. This will just help create the sense of normal shadow and depth across all the cloth. So we're just going to continue to frame in what we've done and just kind of push the effect a little bit more. Just This isn't going to be a, a stage that takes too much time and will really help with precise application to give that realistic sense that we want when the model is finished. With the more pronounced folds in the material, you can now start really making those pop by keeping your highlights as tight and thin as you can across the big creases. And with the larger areas of blocked out cloth, you can now really start creating more definition there by bringing your paint application more towards the outside of these areas and leaving the inside still showing the previous layer. 
as we want to make sure we've still got the wash layers and the previous layer stages showing all the way through the model. Now, finally, when you're happy with how the material looks, we're going to apply a final fine edge highlight with a mix of Evil Sun Scarlet and Troll Slayer Orange. The concentration of these two should be an approximate 50-50 split between, but be very careful, if you find your paint looking too orange, just tone it back down with more Evil Sun Scarlet. We don't want to overblow the look of the red by making it look too garish and too orange. So we're now just going to apply this to the outermost folds of material and the upper crests, concentrating more on where the light would naturally be hitting, which includes the very top and the very edges and tips of all the fold creases, the most upper areas of cloth, providing a little bit of extra detail just to make the upper areas of all this cloth really pop. So this is where the light will be hitting most prominently. When you're finished, you should have a really nice, rich, regal, flowing look to all the material on both a Lindel and a Silder. Now, we're going to very carefully block in all the trim around the models. This is more prominent on areas such as the cloth hanging down by their hips, as well as the cloth which is exposed over their, their chest plate armour. We're going to block this back in now with dry up bark. We don't want to go straight in with the main colour we're going to use for this as there won't be a defined line between the trim and the red and then we'll lose definition. Uh, we also don't want to use anything too dark as the contrast between the beigey sandy colours we're going to use in a second and the red will be too stark. So we found dry up bark was a really good muted mid-tone for this as this complements both hues of the trim and the red cloth really effectively. Make sure your brush has got a nice thin tip and take your time keeping your application in long, thin lines rather than lots of broken lines. Now we're going to go over again with a very thin brush with a good point. We're going to layer over all this trim with XV88. This is a nice, rich, sandy brown which will complement well with the red and doesn't take away from the impact of the gold we've already painted. We did consider doing gold, but again we don't want the models to blend in too much we want to keep them visually impactful so we thought this is more of an embroidered look so we'll go with a more natural muted matte tone and we found XV88 gives that richness and that regality that we really want to capture on these two. And now for the next stage we need to highlight all these trims with Baylor Brow. Uh, we don't need to go across all the trims, we just kind of need to follow the flow of the material and concentrate these on where the material naturally crests and where the upper folds are again, as we did similarly to the application of paint on the actual material, just down the edges, trying to leave a little bit of XV88 on either side as much as we can. So we recommend using a size zero brush at minimum and making sure your brush has got a really thin point to it. So take your time, don't rush, and by the time you're done, you'll have a really effective look to all the trim and the red, which complements well. Now this next stage is purely optional. We opted for, for it just to give that little bit of extra popping detail. But you can apply a very, very thin and precise dot highlight just to the absolute tips and edges and breaks in the trim. So using pallid witch flesh just to show where the light will be hitting off these little areas and just to give it a little bit more impact when you're looking at the model as a whole. Okay, so now we're going to pick out all the boots 
the gloves on his cylinder and all the belts and straps over both models with Rhinox hide. This would be a nice rich brown which will translate well to a slightly more aged leather look when we get through to the finished highlight stages a bit later on. Be very careful when you're picking out all the belts and straps not to bleed out onto any of the, uh, the red fabric or any of the armour plating. Make sure you clip all the belts and straps that are holding the chainmail in place under their arms as well as the belts and straps holding Sildur's arm armour in place. Now we're going to apply an all over layer, predominantly to just the boots and the gloves on a cylinder. We're not going to worry too much about picking out all the belts and straps over these models with this layer stage, as these are quite small surface areas and won't really benefit too much from this layer stage, whereas the boots and the gloves have a lot more defined material, a lot more recesses and creases, which will allow the next wash stage to flow in nicely and create nice definition. So these particular areas really work well with this layer stage. Once you're happy with the look of the leathers and the wash is properly dried, we're going to reapply the previous mix as a layer, again, mainly over the boots and the gloves. With the boots, you want to focus on separating out the larger surface areas and leaving the wash showing in the recesses. With the Sildur's gloved hands, you want to focus on separating out the individual fingers and blocking out the back of the hand to create natural depth and definition in the gloves as he's gripping the sword. Now finally, with a at minimum a size zero brush or size zero zero, we're going to apply some extreme edge highlights to all the leather and brown areas with Gawthor Brown. With the boots, it's quite easy just to frame the outside of the boot and cover over any of the creases and, re and raised areas as the material bunches up. The belts are a little bit more tricky and a little bit more time consuming as you want to frame these belts on both sides. So make sure you've got, again, a really good point to your brush and draw these in really thin, precise lines over the outer edges on both the top and the bottom of all the straps. With the Sildur's gloved hands, you can focus now on just creating definition and picking out the knuckle joints and the tips of the fingers as well as the palm of the hand where the light will be hitting as he holds Narsil up in defiance of Sauron. Again, take your time with this stage and try not to bleed over onto any chain mail. It's not the end of the world if you do because a little dry brush of the metal mix will bring that back up, but it's just an unnecessary step and we don't want to risk any blemishes harming the overall look of this model. So with that, Sildur is now done, but we've still got a little bit more to do on the end deal. We have the outside and the inside of his cloak left to finish. Uh, so we're going to start off just by base coating the outside of his cloak with a thin down layer of Abaddon Black. Now apply an all over layer with a mix of Abaddon Black and Skaven Black Dinge. We're going to keep the Skaven Black Dinge concentration really quite low as the cloak is black and not grey. So we really want these dark tones to shine through. We don't want to overwhelm the cloak. Once the wash is dry, now we're going to carefully re-layer over with the previous Abaddon Black Skaven Black Dinge mix, leaving the Nuln Oil showing in the very deepest recesses. It won't actually look like you've painted an awful lot of detail on there, but bear with, it's worth it in the long run. When you're happy with how that layer looks, we're going to increase the amount of Skaven Black Dinge to an approximate 50-50 split with the Abaddon Black, and again, as we did with all the red material, focus on more of the outer and upper areas of cloak folds, to create natural depth and definition and pushing the initial layer stage further and further by keeping these highlights slightly tighter, slightly thinner, showing all the dark tones coming through underneath. Now we're going to apply a fine highlight by adding in some Dawnstone to the Abaddon Black Skaven Black Dinge mix. And again, by keeping your brush with a nice thin point and keeping your brush strokes as tight and thin as possible, we're going to further push the highlights 
just to create more flow and definition by focusing on the outer and upper areas of this cloak, including the very edge where it cascades down on the right hand side of his torso. You have to be very careful when it comes to doing things like black highlights, as too much grey or too much white too fast in the mix will overblow the mix and make it look really unnatural. And finally, we're going to increase the Dawnstone concentration in the mix to an approximate 50-50 split between Dawnstone and the Abaddon Skaven Blight Dinge mix. And we're just going to apply this in very thin, tight, precise highlights on the absolute upper areas of the cloak folds. This will just give a nice sense of light glinting off the dark, rich black of the cloak. Now we're going to very carefully paint the underside of Elendil's cloak where it folds up against himself with more gas bone. The interior of Elendil's cloak is more beigey and bone-like in colour, which is a nice contrast between the black of the exterior of the cloak. Working out where this base coat needs to go can be tricky, so follow our guide here. We focus on the bits of material that are visibly folded up against him, as well as the cloak that would naturally be showing from his underside as he's lying on the ground. Again, you want to apply this in a few thin down layers as the more gas bone doesn't cover too well over the Abaddon Black. To keep your layers nice and thin and you'll have a nice smooth finish for us to work the highlights off of later on. Now we're going to layer over all the underside areas of the cloak with a 50-50 mix of more gas bone and Screaming Skull. Again, as with the more gas bone base coat, nice, thin, smooth layers will give you a nice crisp finish for the following highlight stages. Once your Seraphim Sepia wash is dried, we can now reapply the previous mix, leaving the wash showing in the recesses. Again, follow the mentality we use for all the robes and the material up to this point, and you'll create a nice sense of flowing material across the very defined folds of the underside of Elendil's cloak. Now we're going to highlight these areas with pure Screaming Skull, just to create more definition and flow across the underside of Elendil's cloak. Again, these areas are quite well defined, so it's quite easy to work out where these highlights need to go. Finally, we're going to use a mix of Screaming Skull and our favourite paint ever, Pallid Witch Flesh, just to apply a final edge highlight to the outermost areas of these underside cloak areas and to really make the final highlight stages pop and give that sense of flowing material that we want. Now this next stage is purely optional, but we opted to do some real life battle damage to Elendil. So we used Blood for the Blood Gob, which is a technical gloss paint, and we applied some battle damage wounds to Elendil's forehead, running down the mouth into his beard, and also around the outside of his helmet. If you don't have Blood for the Blood God, this effect can also be achieved with a mix of Corn Red, Rhinox Hide, and a slight gloss varnish over top, just for that little bit of extra realism. And there you have it, Elendil and Isildur, prone, in the face of Sauron, finished, ready to set Middle-earth on the path towards Sauron's eventual destruction.